Okay, thank. Uh, I think you can all hear me. Thank you so much, Dave. And Dave uh, forgot to mention that Dave and I go back a long way. Actually, back I think it is to 1993, uh, if I remember rightly, when Dave was running a company in Sydney, and a friend of mine called Peter Bailey who uh, uh, was working for Dave on developer tools. In fact, the first person I'd ever met who d directly worked on developer tools. And I think the year before I had just gone and bought myself a copy of Ball and C++ and other tools like that that were popular back then. And uh, Peter, Peter was working on small talk tooling with Dave. Uh, at a, I think a company ultimately bought by IBM, if I remember right. And anyway, uh, here we are again, quite a long time later. Uh, and I get to work on developer tools and it's been a lot of fun to do that over the years. It was an unexpected turn in my career after after Cambridge. And, um, and it's really, really great to be here. Now I'm sharing my screen. Do you need this minimized over on the right? I guess I will minimize this. Everything's fine. Okay, Grant, thank you very much. Uh, I will be checking the Slack during the talk. If you, uh, uh, if I can bring it up, let me just bring up Slack. Where's it gone? Slack. I will bring that up. So if you, I know there's a bit of a delay in the presentation. If you have questions, uh, you pop them into the the q a with don syme on the slack uh let me just come over to here and q a with don syme and you can pop in questions over there jonah says wait you're australian and yes jonah i am australian i am originally from toowoomba uh, is where i was born uh, and I grew up there and then uh, went to school there. Uh, my father was in wheat research, uh, creating new varieties of wheat for the Australian wheat growers. And uh, then I went off to university in Canberra at the Australian National University and, uh, and there met uh, Malcolm Newey, uh, Professor Na Malcolm Newey, who was working on a version of the ML programming language among other things, and had been one of the early and uh, early contributors to the uh, design of the ML programming language, and he was working on a thing called ANU ML. And so I first got involved in functional programming through that and through working in theorem provers. And then I made my way to Cambridge and, uh, and joined Microsoft Research after that. So uh, let, let's crack on with the talk. I know we, we haven't got so much time, but I will be checking the uh, questions as we go. Happy to answer any questions you have at all. This is a somewhat informal talk, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. So the, this, this talk is originally sort of what's new in F-Sharp 5.0, but as I was putting together the slides of, you know, what is new in F-Sharp 5.0, we... Um, I realized, you know, in order to understand what's new in F-Sharp 5.0, you have to really understand the perspective, some of the perspectives on language design from where I'm coming from in, in what, how I think about programming, why I care so much about delivering a particular kinds of functional programming experiences to, uh, so that they can be widely used and adopted and sort of why some things are in the F-sharp language and why some things aren't in the F-sharp language. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions about this too. Uh, there are, uh, I, I know I'm speaking to a very functionally literate crowd here and you probably have a lot of questions about uh, why certain things were included and, and why they weren't. I have some, uh, I'm happy to answer those questions and have those discussions. And I just want to try and set a, set a bit of a foundation for that. So one way to do that is to talk about code I love and code I, I, I don't like uh, so quite so much. And, also and then how that relates to language features, also what we're doing today in F-sharp. Obviously, this also has guided the design of F-sharp all the way through. One of the things I'm really happy with with F-sharp is that the the core of what F-sharp is about, okay, which is to bring the benefits of functional programming into the .NET ecosystem or, uh, and to bring the benefits of an ecosystem to functional programming. The core of what that is, uh, has been about has held very steady. And in fact, how that manifests itself in actual code 
has also held very steady through the lifetime of F sharp. The core of F sharp has not is based. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's what this this brilliant, beautiful idea that that sort of that, that that holds true throughout this incredibly changing time in programming languages history. And uh, I, I actually cover a lot of this in a paper I've written recently. Uh, I've, I, wrote, I wrote it about a couple of years ago and then finalized it for, for the Hopple Conference, the History of Programming Languages Conference. And I'd encourage anyone interested in the language design or anyone actually interested in how computing has changed and how that looks like from the perspective of a person working at the, at, at the pro level of programming languages and run, run times. Uh, go and have a read of this paper. It's quite long, but it's quite, um, I think it's quite an enjoyable read. I've tried to capture, I'm a bit of a fan of these styles of history telling uh, that capture some of the texture of a time and a place and the people that are involved. And the, the sort of coincidences that are involved or the um, serendipities or the tensions as well. And so, uh, please do go and take a read of this paper. It is really quite quite enjoyable. And part of the structuring of the paper is about this this what holds what holds true, uh, what holds firm in the uh, in the in the history of the the, the of functional programming. And this, my starting point is about 1972, when the very first versions of the ML, fam where Hindley Milner type inference is invented. Uh, it, it finds an actual realization in the early versions of the ML programming language. But, but not only what was that from a programming language perspective, but why were those people making that language? What was it for? What was in their minds when they, when they made that thing? Uh, and then how it, it kind of progressed and diverged. And we got things like standard ML and OCaml. And also we got things like Hope and we got things like Haskell. And uh, and other uh, and Scott, yeah. So that and then that covers this sort of first part of the history, and then and then I talk about this sort of big and important phenomenon, which is about the same time. It actually relates to what I was talking about with, about about meeting Dave, uh, which is the object, what I call the object-oriented tidal wave, and that is this sort of huge thing that sweeps the industry, starting with Smalltalk, but most importantly then with C plus plus, and then even more importantly Java. Uh, which uh, everything suddenly had to be an object. Literally, people would say, well, if your language, everything's not an object, then don't bother about the language. It's like uh, implementation of inheritance became an Im incredibly important sort of almost like a shibboleth or a, a, a measure. You know, if it didn't support certain technical features, then you're then you were sort of out of certain conversations. And I talk about this tidal wave, but I'm interested in not just sort of the technicalities of that, but what happened to the people who were involved on various sides of that. I talk about how that tidal wave affected Microsoft, this massive company that uh, had such a dominant and even monopolistic position in computing at this stage. And uh, and then we know some of that history about the interactions with Java and it's the creation of .NET and then the, the various kind of some court cases and things that happen. And, and uh, but it's also, so that is one part of this object or object title wave. But then I also look at what happened with the functional programming community and the various kinds of reactions they have to, uh, to the object oriented tidal wave and there's a whole range of different reactions some people go and work on object calculi to kind of try to characterize this sort of formal foundations of what people are trying to get at with object oriented programming some people just uh, go some people go and work on moving object oriented features into uh, functional languages you see OCaml developed for example some people work on taking functional features and putting them into object oriented languages uh, and uh, some people work on taking functional languages pure uh, in their pure sense and making them run on object uh, on the on, on on things like the the JVM and so we see things like MLJ be developed uh, and these early experiments in, in using those runtimes as multi-language runtimes 
at any way. I do cover more of the history from that perspective. And a lot of what uh, you still see running through the industry today is these uh, actions and reactions and people looking for synergies, people looking for uh, um, sort of uh, di what you might say dialectic to take two things that are opposing and seem in tension and to try to find a positive kind of progression from that. And F sharp is very much in that tradition. And the core thing with F sharp was always about, here's this wonderful thing, which is the core of functional programming. And we see this core, we know how productive it is. Uh, and we, we had experienced it in the context of these theorem proving systems. And we wanted to make that real in industry. Many, many people wanted to make it real in industry and lots of different attempts at doing this. And uh, um, they, there's this, there's this it's, a, it's a passionate desire that's not just kind of a religious fervor, but it's an actual knowledge of the importance of functional programming techniques and how underappreciated they are how they have to, in some sense, learn to coexist with object-oriented programming, and we have to find a way to make these things work together. And this is what causes us to work on generics in .NET. It's what causes Scala to come into existence. Is uh, It's what causes me to start F-sharp. It's what causes Clojure to come into existence. Uh, and it's the same shared knowledge of the power of functional programming as we've experienced it personally in those years in various ways and this certainty that we have to make it work in practice okay so where does that leave us today you know we we have uh, we we have this history, we have this, you know, things that we've all been involved in this great effort to, uh, to make functional programming real. And we have succeeded. We have not only succeeded with F sharp, but we have succeeded with all the functional programming languages represented at Lambda Jam. But we have also, frankly, we have succeeded in owning the industry. We've uh, C sharp today, everything they're adding to C sharp is pretty much everything is basically functional programming. The, uh, the, uh, when you look at the same can be said uh, of Java, uh, the, um, uh, you look at uh, when they add async programming into Python, they, and async is related to functional programming, and may, you may not realize it, but it stems from F sharp originally, this async await. Uh, kind of feature, which is now you see in C++, you now you see it in Python, now you see it in C Sharp, and you see it probably in Java as well, and, and coming in Scala, no doubt, and so on. Uh, so we see this huge influence of functional on the practice of programming, whether through the functional languages or not. And of course, one of the actual manifestations of that is that F Sharp is a uh, you know, wonderfully solid functional programming tool that you can trust and pick up and use in practice in, in enterprise contexts that used to be the most conservative, rigid uh, context to be found on the planet. In, my, in my, uh, my way of looking at the world, the, the world breaks down into 50% of, of the industry are incredibly willing to adopt new techniques, and then 50% of the industry are very, very conservative about what they use and adopt. And one of the great things about F Sharp is because it comes from Microsoft and it's uh, and uh, it, it originates from Microsoft. It's all open source and cross-platform and a very normal language in many in in its kind of technical existence in many many ways. Uh, but it is immensely enterprise trustworthy, and uh, so it can address a part of the industry that that some other uh, tooling sometimes can struggle to kind of uh, to reach and, and address. That said, F Sharp is not just a .NET language. This is how we position it. F Sharp is an open source uh, cross-platform language. And uh, it is also a JavaScript language. And this side is more community oriented. And there is an excellent JavaScript compiler for F Sharp called Fable. And I just want to say this is important because sometimes these things are not at parity in a sense. There's some it's a toy JavaScript compiler for a language. But Fable is actually uh, a really wonderful tool chain. And you can really approach F Sharp as a JavaScript developer and effectively use F Sharp as a, subs as a substitute for, for TypeScript 
uh, or for JavaScript, but they're all for TypeScript. So you can use it in that way if you want. I just want to mention that from the start that you don't have to think of F Sharp as a .NET language. I just want to show how you get started with it. You know, the .NET uh, tool chain is available absolutely everywhere. I put a few logos on the right, but it's available many, many other places. Uh, it's just a standard open source cross-platform tool chain that you can get on Linux. It's all fully open source. So it's still this idea that somehow that F Sharp is for Windows still lurks around with people, but it's absolutely not the case. The majority of F Sharp usage would happen on Linux today. I believe in terms of execution. Uh, so F Sharp tools are available as, as a standard part of the .NET SDK. Uh, there's nothing extra installed here besides the .NET SDK, and you can that's a standard packaging across all the different ecosystems. You can use it everywhere. And I just do just want to say, yeah, these two th this getting started experience is immensely sweet. If you want to get started for F Sharp for the back end, you use a system called Giraffe. Uh, which is a functional ASP.NET uh, micro web framework and for server side. And it is really a beautiful way to program on the server side. We all know that server side is fundamentally async functional programming. And so that F sharp just absolutely flies in this context. So high and it's the performance because it's built on ASP.NET Core, which is one of the most performant uh, web frameworks in existence you get this extremely high performance functional first server side programming. And as you look at these things, I don't just I, I do want to put them I put them in that historical context. Go back to that paper, look through where functional programming was in two th in at, at this at the start of the journey with F sharp. And just think where we are now in terms of practicality, in terms of interoperability, in terms of reusing things like ASP.NET Core, in terms of performance, in terms of tooling. We have come so far, and not only with F Sharp, but many different tool chains have come this far. And it's all been part of that common story. But uh, just take a while to stop and think just how far we've come and what a wonderful position functional programming is in today. To say, if you want to get started for the, the front end, you can do, uh, you do install the .NET tool chain and some templates through that, then you do .NET new fable, and then you do npm install and start. And the, the great thing about this is, although you do have that .NET SDK installed for, for part of the compilation support, basically, conceptually, from the programmer's point of view, you're operating in the NPM ecosystem. In the, and so it's like TypeScript. It lives happily in the Node NPM eco ecosystem. You can use it as a JavaScript first language and a lot of the tooling and uh, idioms and everything that work uh, with uh, in this, when you're coming to F Sharp from this perspective, uh, you, f you can feel pretty much like a JavaScript developer. Uh, uh, just to say there are some other options, you can use WebAssembly, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over this. Uh, you can also do this full stack programming. I just want to just give a taste for these four entry points into the F Sharp ecosystem, just so you know where to start and just so you get a feel for what people do today, how you can, how you can get started. So uh, you can, companies like uh, the Norway's public broadcaster, NRK, use a safe stack to do all sorts of wonderful work. This is a combination of Giraffe and Fable uh, running the back, the, the back end on Azure uh, as the cloud platform. Okay, and just to say, you know, this functional thing really, really does work. You can look at the testimonials. Uh, you've got plenty of examples from your own, uh, from your own communities if you're not programming in F Sharp. Uh, one great example is this one. Uh, it had 350,000 lines of C Sharp, gets into 30,000 lines of robust F Sharp. Uh, and that was, uh, it's, it was written up uh, by Simon Cousins a few years ago. And I'll skip over this just to look at some line counts. C Sharp code had 56,000 lines of curly braces. Uh, it had 3,000 null checks compared to 15 in F Sharp. Uh, null check, nulls are uncommon in F Sharp. They can occur at interrupt boundaries. Uh, so hence you might have some, at, uh, but you can just see the scale of difference we have in this kind of application, uh, which delivered the same functionality. Uh, so that functional first approach, it's a terminology we use in F Sharp, which I think is very appropriate in other settings as well. Uh, that, you know, it's, a, it, it's not only a difference in language, it's a difference in methodology and it's a difference in thinking, it's a difference in how you conceptualize programming. And this shines through in F Sharp. 
And uh, they had a wonderful zero bug deployment in this and it's an incredibly safe language all the way, built all the way through F Sharp is this notion of safety, rigidity through an appropriate level of rigidity in typing, but a lightness that comes through type inference. And that's a standard, the standard thing that, that this core functional programming gives you. And so we have a wonderful community in F Sharp and it centers around the F Sharp Software Foundation and F Sharp.org. And you can go and check that out. Okay, so now I want to talk about language design and features and things like that. And so we have, of course, a language design process. Everything is open. You can see where we're at with uh, at FS Lang Design and FS Lang Suggestions. Please come along and contribute. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you're not using F Sharp, uh, if you're coming from some other community, please uh, come and contribute your own perspectives on, on, on where F Sharp needs to be. Uh, and we'd love to hear, let's get great cross fertilization. And I wish we could be having those hallway chats even as we, as we speak uh, to cross fertilize between our different communities. Just to give you a scope of the kind of stage we're at uh, in what comes in and what kind of features do get in to F Sharp as we evolve them. This is looking back a little bit in time. I started at F Sharp 4.1. And you can see here, for instance, F Sharp uh, allows you to use unboxed struct tuples, uh, un so unboxed records, unboxed union types. And so, you know, there was a cycle. These are fantastic for performance. And because we sit on top of .NET generics, we still get all the wonderful properties of generic code. There's nothing, there's, these fit very, very beautifully into the F-sharp language. They, they were just things we previously hadn't supported. And so we're kind of filling in the, um, just making sure there are no, you know, you have tuples, you have generics, you have unbox tuples, make sure that in F-sharp, make sure that works in F-sharp. So in fact, by adding these things, we actually make the language more performant and we actually make it simpler as well. Okay. You might need an extra de declaration to get unboxing to kick in, but that's all. You just put struct on a type and, and, and it becomes unboxed. And, every, and because you're functional, then that works out really nicely, right? Because so we're actually concentrating on these features which, which help functional programming fulfill its role to be even more simple. Uh, uh, we can forget that first point. There's an old slide. I'm not going to do more on that optional large script cycles. Uh, but we've been adding lots of things like this. So what else did we do? F sharp 5.0 in 2018, we did a span of T. Now span of T is an interesting beast. You probably, it would be a separate talk all of its own. But what uh, span of T is actually comes from the, um, uh, from C sharp, and it actually comes from work to make C sharp web uh, programming be far uh, uh, to be have much lower allocation rates, and it's a major part of what allows uh, those incredible performance statistics for ASP.NET Core for web serving is they just have such uh, incredibly low allocation rates um, in their web serving uh, core, uh, pipelines. Uh, and well, uh, it's actually a feature that doesn't fit that nicely into functional programming. You, where it, so it's a low level feature for high performance code, but we did put it into F sharp to make sure we could get full access into the .NET libraries and get all the benefits of these uh, high performance situations. Uh, and then, of course, we have all these tooling updates that we push through, where we push through things like improving async debugging. And then, then in F sharp 4.6, we came back and we did some language work, which is uh, previously F sharp had only had nominal record types, and we uh, put in did the work to make you uh, able to do anonymous record types. Fairly major feature. Uh, it. Um, we concentrate on the functional programming notion of records, much as you would get them in Haskell. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a good uh, feature that fits well with the functional programming paradigm once again. Sharp 4.7, we uh, made improvements to this thing called computation expressions to, uh, and we started doing proper language version and we did a whole lot of work on the syntax for the white space aware syntax and we did lots of improvements. And then F-Sharp 5.0, which has just come out, 
in 2021, there's a whole bunch of really good features. Uh, we have Hashar Nougat support. So in your scripts, you can just reference packages in your scripts, Hashar Nougat, and then give a package name or a package version. People, this makes f -sharp scripting incredibly powerful. .NET Interactive Notebook support, Jupyter support, string imp interpolation, and then, uh, then again, we take these features which are in our, sh in our shop, we'll talk about this more, this computation expression feature, and we think, how can we make this feature that we already have for expressing f compositional functional computations even more powerful? And in particular, we can do monadic computations, we can do what I call monoidal computations, lists and sequences and so on. Uh, can we also do applicatives in this in in this uh, syntax? Uh, and we we put in support for that, and it's absolutely fantastic. And uh, you can read about that in the various links uh, through the the link at the bottom. And all the way along, I've actually missed out many things. We've actually been improving interop into .NET. We've actually been improving interop into JavaScript as well. Uh, that's one of the reasons for anonymous records. And then we improved these sort of performance of these core core data structures. Uh, and OK, so that gives you a fair kind of a, 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 a taste for the history. It gives you a taste for the uh, features that we're adding. Uh, and so what underlies that about my personal thoughts about coding? Obviously, I love functional programming, uh, and, it, and it guides through all of this. But I have my biases when it comes to functional programming and other kinds of programming and how we make functional programming work in conjunction with other things. All the way along, it's all not just about being a zealot for functional programming, it's about being making functional programming work in context, work in interoperability, work in software engineering context, work in team context. So uh, we need to work through all of those things. So there's lots of opinions in this part of the talk. The first part of the talk is more, you know, fact, this part's opinion. Uh, so if you want to, uh, one, one place to sort of mine for f -sharp code is the uh, f -sharp advent calendar. And I've listed out some of the users. It's a slightly old slide, this one. It goes back uh, to 2017, 16, and way back. Started by F Sharp users in Japan, and I, I spent some while mining some of this to look at like F Sharp code I, I, I love, and this was the very first uh, uh, F Sharp calendar, I think. Uh, and if we go even back a little bit further, what was this foundation of the F Sharp design? I've touched on this. This is it, it, this was a slide I used. It's got those kind of horrible looking kind of PowerPoint things. It's a slide I use at uh, Microsoft Research Tech Fest in 2007 to explain what f -sharp's about. And to, it was this thing, the combination counts. It's, it's not just about functional programming. In fact, I don't even mention the word functional programming on this slide. Uh, the, uh, the, yeah, so, you know, how do you, you know, what counts? Static typing counts for lots of positive reasons. Succinctness really counts. Scalability, libraries, being explorative, being interoperable, being efficient. I've touched on many of those themes, and it's the fact that we deliver all of these together without making, uh, there are trade-offs, of course, between these things, but it is the combination, the package of things that we're delivering with f -sharp, uh, which is so crucial in uh, unlocking the potential of functional programming. So obviously, if I'm want to combine these things. These are the things that I love in coding. We want uh, we want code that is succinct. Uh, I, I do have absolutely learned to love uh, write as soon as I, actually the very first time I started using ML, I didn't, uh, an, an ML, a functional language, I actually didn't like it that much. It was only when I had to start doing real work in the theorem proving domain that I've really learned to love the Hinley Miller type inference and its succinctness and it's like it's this magical sort of expressivity and uh, also how performant that code was. So uh, there's a program in F-Shop where you can print something out. Uh, it's no ceremony, it's not even functional programming particularly, just using printf, but it works extremely well and it's, uh, it's nice. That is the full program in F-Sharp. So obviously I'm in that uh, typical functional programming thing of wanting low ceremony programming. It just says what it says, print out hello world. 
Uh, at FGRF, of course, you'll see the core of functional programming. You'll see it expressed in, uh, very often in, through lots of pipelining. We love our pipelining. You'll see lots and lots and lots of it in f -sharp code. We do tend to prefer data flowing from left through functional chains like this, and we don't uh, less backwards than in other language languages. Uh, so here's a typical thing. You'll get some uh, array of data just taken from the F-sharp tooling implementation, and then you'll filter and do a parallel map, and then a filter and a group by and a map, and so on, and that's just fine. So uh, one of the striking things about looking through the F-sharp advent calendar about what people really are loving doing with F-sharp is, uh, is, is, of course, domain modeling. And this is uh, this is part of the domain model in that uh, I, one of the domain models are in, in theorem proving, which one sort of starts with. You start with the propositional logic and you model the domain of parse propositional logic expressions, and then you just code up loads and loads of logic over that recursion, normalization, whatever. And then you look at another domain, which is, say, the F-sharp optimizer, and you have what is the core data structure of the domain? Well, the core data structure is what do we know about an expression? And this is the data structure that represents it. And so, and I bring this out in this history of F-sharp paper, uh, the, uh, the early history of F-sharp, as being when you really look at what these theorem-proving people were doing back in the 1970s, what they had is a domain, not, not too different to this. They might, might have been working in higher order logic instead of propositional logic, but they had a domain. Uh, and they needed to then have a meta language to program up lots of things in that domain. And they loved how they could model things in this, in, in the, they, were they wanted the succinct notations for modeling and they wanted the succinct notations for for, for programming up over that over the domains after they have modeled them. And what's really curious and beautiful to me is how that is still what everybody is doing today. You know, that they, they, they found a solution to this very general problem of domain, domains and programming. And then they, you know, everybody does it today. And that's even to the point uh, that we have entire books on basically that technique, domain modeling made functional. And uh, I really encourage you to Scott Wallachian. And there's also a book called Get Programming with F-Sharp that covers quite a lot of this. And um, a domain modeling, domain semantics. And, you know, that continuity in, you know, when you think of all the things that have changed in the software industry over the years, all the tidal waves of things that have come and gone uh, over, you know, uh, the, but the core activity uh, of domain modeling and, and domain semantics was so beautifully solved by the original designers of these functional programming languages. And um, yeah, so that's really holds true. And you see it. So here we have Odie from Nigeria, for example, talking about uh, cracking data from the iPhone, uh, from the APIs related to uh, uh, I, I think it's Apple Music and, I, and his iPhone statistics and so on. And he's programming up uh, the data he's getting from the web service. And he kind of gives this comment, you know, your choice of data structures and how you design your domain is crucial when writing code in F Sharp or other languages. Screw it up and you'll be working or walking around in circles. Nail it and your implementation will be concise, straightforward, and probably even trivial. And that is such a uh, perceptive observation. And I, um, you know, really nails that that point, uh, and and it stands in a historical tradition uh, of domain modeling and domain semantics, which uh, I think we need to be even more forceful now that functional programming is so practical, so real. We need to be even more forceful about about uh, staking out functional programming as the solution to these the, this domain. All right, what other code do I love? Uh, we do have this, uh, you know, this this sort of code, this wonderful combination of features in F-sharp. Here we have what's called a type provider, which actually at compile time can go and scrape the uh, a website. Uh, and so, and it give you a structured, strongly typed view over the HTML structure you're getting back from a particular website. And then you can do strongly typed programming over 
uh, the results of these NuGet package statistics coming back for a particular thing. And you get strong typing, completion, tooling, everything over the data domain, which you're picking up from an external data source, a database, or whatever it is. And it's, you know, this is just a, you know, getting your types from the web and programming up over them using good tooling. You know, this is, this is magical. Uh, another area I've been shocked at with F with F actually, I hadn't realized how important functional was to user interface programming. And of course, Elm is the amazing language in this space for showing the world how relevant functional programming is to web programming. To the to the U, to the front to the front end, and uh, you can uh, with this model view update MVU uh, architectures that um, Elm has uh, inspired in every functional language and also in languages like C sharp and elsewhere, and uh, you can do this in F sharp. You can do it in Fable, uh, and you get this uh, this kind of thing. This is for a mobile app. Uh, that you have some model and you have some view function and then you, it generates uh, elements and which can dynamically change. So this this kind of uh, expressing the core uh, the core update uh, in or the core view invariance of a user interface using functional programming. Uh, I hadn't realized when I was doing F-sharp, I had always said in early F-sharp, F-sharp's for the back end, not for the front end. You have to do all that object-oriented stuff on the front end and I was wrong. Uh, the F sharp is well, functional in general is incredibly relevant for very large amounts of of user interface uh, development, and uh, that's this is what it looks like in Fable for web programming. You can see very, just an HTML DSL down below putting together various uh, elements of the uh, the view in a fairly normal way. Okay, uh, F-sharp, of course, is functional. We love composition. Here's an example of the kind of code that is just using function composition, piping uh, down uh, between these various functions and collecting up errors and the like. It's very nice. People uh, love to see structure of an application sort of broken down through simple uh, composition of functions or asynchronous functions or other such things. Uh, okay, and to say we're also getting this compositionality, of course, for web handling, uh, using giraffe or other things. Uh, so here's just a sample bit of code for a web app, which has HTTP handlers and the various routes we're expressing. Okay, so I've been all very positive about functional code, but I actually want to say not all functional code is good code. And this is, uh, you know, the other side of the coin. You know, functional is not a perfect thing and can be heavily misused. And one thing you'll notice and uh, is missing from the F sharp design is curry and uncurry. And you'll say, how could you be missing curry and uncurry from the core library of F sharp? You know, here, you know, even in the names, curry. Surely you have to have it. You know, it's part of the functional programming tradition. Okay, but, you know, I once encountered somebody who used to like doing this sort of thing: curry the string dot compare function and then apply it to two arguments. Okay. Uh, because they somehow thought there was a virtue in making things uh, into curried functions. And, you know, in F sharp, you can just call the string.compare function, taking to a tuple of arguments, and, and string.compare comes from whatever.net libraries or uh, Fable libraries. And you can do that. You don't have to. <laughs> if you're just going to apply it, you don't have to. Of course, you might say, well, that's just silly. No one should do that anyway. Uh, but we see a lot of uh, incredibly, once you give people curry and uncurry, they just write code that other people can't understand. And, you know, I'm pretty, I haven't got formal proof of this, but I'm pretty sure that people just don't get it. Okay, people continually lose uh, lose this. It's too indecipherable too often to use not the seek.zip or seek.map, it's the use of uncurry. And it's just better just write out the lambda in this case if you really need to uh, do this kind of thing. And I say that because it does make code clearer, it makes it vastly more debuggable in a, in a, in a professional debugger. Uh, and so just write, just write it out. So a similar thing is this backpipe operator. You saw forward piping earlier, 
And, uh, well, we have a backpipe operator in F-sharp, and you see people doing this kind of weird stuff where they forward pipe for a while and then they backpipe into various things. And, uh, look, I actually forget the precedences of these various operators in some ways, and you certainly don't do this kind of thing. And in general, you know, it turns out this code could have just been written in some much more simpler way like this, I think if I've got that right. Uh, and they, um, so my rule with the F-sharp community is you can occasionally use a backpipe operator, but really think carefully about it and never use it in beginner samples. Be aware that beginners are coming to a functional, the core of functional programming with a very limited set of uh, intuitions and uh, and a knowledge and and just you just think very carefully about when to use this kind of operator and never ever put them on the same line. Uh, that's just that's just not going to work. And then there are these uh, multi-argument backpipe operators and uh, they should be removed from F sharp. That we should deprecate those. Do not use them. Uh, they uh, they they really aren't to be used. So in general, point-free code in F sharp, point-free itself is not a virtue, coding without explicit lambdas or lets. And you'll often see uh, people, once they discover how to uh, program with computed functions, they'll start to use point-free all the time. And they'll start to write this kind of code, list.map brackets plus 10, meaning partially apply the plus function to 10 and get a function which adds 10. And then they'll write double an increment of sort of times two plus one, and whatever. It, it's just not worth it. Uh, now, the language doesn't enforce anything. You can write this code in F-sharp, but uh, this sort of overuse of point-free code is strongly discouraged in F-sharp. It's not seen as a virtue in any way to, to make things point-free in F-sharp. In fact, in many of the places in things like Haskell where where this is seen as a virtue uh, more, if not, uh, we, we get with a feature called computation expressions, and I'll get to that now. Okay. Uh, just to say, fold in F-sharp is generally considered harmful. There's almost certainly better ways, things to do than you fold. Some by max by choose, try pick, map fold, reduce. Fold is one of the last things you learn in F-sharp because you can do nearly everything without doing a fold. It's very, very rare. Um, Okay, so I will skip some things. I want to talk briefly about objects in F sharp. F sharp does have objects. Uh, we have inputs to object construction, object internals, and exported properties here. It's a nice, fun great for functional objects. So these are the language features here. We have types, interface types, and object expressions. And here's an example of uh, information in, functional information, immutable information in, encapsulated immutable computation, and then information out. And it's a wonderful feature. It's very nominally based, but it's incredibly practical for functional uh, programming, comp computing uh, encapsulated tables and summaries. But if you look at the features of OO, a big part of the F-sharp design is uh, in uh, deconstructing the features of OO. You have all these features down the left. I won't run through them all. And, uh, and you gotta think, well, you know, OO is a big thing. And what do we do with this? Some of these make, uh, some of these are good for F-sharp and some of them are good for performance properties. Some of them are necessary for interrupt and some of them really aren't needed. And so we kind of split this into things which we embrace, like the dot notation is embraced in F sharp. X dot length is totally fine. It's great. And instance members and all the way down, you can read down the list here and you'll get this in any standard F sharp textbook. Then there's a set of things which we do for kind of use, you can use necessarily, tastefully, sparingly, okay. And then there's a set of things which are in the language, uh, which uh, you use very, very rarely uh, and is going down the object rabbit hole to use them very much. And then finally, there's a set of things which are really not supported, okay, in, um, uh, in, in F sharp. So we kind of, basically they're things we love in F sharp and you're, as a, you're encouraged to embrace and accept them. And I think everybody in the functional community should stop and think about that and think about 
easing up a little bit with regard to object programming and learning to love this as a part of your, your functional tool set. We tolerate some things, we mostly avoid some other things, and we completely forget about a bunch of other things. And that brings me to a key point, which is object programming versus object oriented programming. And F sharp is, so let's, what, what do I mean by those things? Yeah, object programming is, is great. Succinct coding, notational convenience, API ergonomics, good naming, practical encapsulation, sensible, small, composable abstractions, expression oriented, making simple things out of potentially complex foundations. Object-oriented programming is something else altogether. Objects as a single paradigm, hierarchical classification, abstract jelly bean factory delegator, large abstractions with many holes and many failure points and focus on declarations, not expressions. And so, so the aim of F -sharp is to embrace object programming, just like we embrace tuple programming or list programming or async programming. Or, uh, or, or programming with sequences as stream programming. Object programming is a fine way to represent information. And we make it fit with the expression-oriented typed functional paradigm. We do not embrace full object orientation unless you happen to be really already stuck in that paradigm for sort of interop reasons or something. Yeah? Uh, and so that's a very important distinction. And I think we should just drop that word oriented and just forcefully be willing as a community, a functional community to own the word object and say that it means something to us and embrace object programming. Yep, I'll finish. Uh, yep, wrap it up in a couple of minutes. Uh, just to say there's a wonderful feature called computation expressions in F sharp. It's just this extensible, intuitive, friendly, monadic notation on steroids. I mentioned it also supports applicatives. Uh, it also supports some monoidal structures. And they get used for lots and lots of options. And it's way more powerful than Haskell do notation. You can, like, Haskell do notation is something from the way back in the archaic days compared to what you can do with uh, monadic notation, uh, sorry, the computational expressions in F-sharp. So get your head into this and you'll enjoy that a lot. Uh, and I would just give one example of that. Here's an example of sort of using list.concat, list.filter. And instead in F-sharp, you would tend to write this, which is where you're yielding a list. It's very generative. You yield, uh, you can have for loops and so on and generating things, but it's all got a functional interpretation through computation expressions. Okay, I will skip our head now. Uh, lots of other properties. I love code that I love. Uh, debugging, commenting, testing, performance under CI, make it readable. Uh, and that brings me to, you know, the, the theme running through this is all about making the core functional programming experience work in practice. Uh, and it's less about the sort of Haskell uh, type uh, programming at the type level. We, you know, F sharp doesn't quite have type classes in the way that sort of Haskell has it. It has another mechanism to support ad hoc overloading. Uh, and it is, um, and it's less about sort of the ML module kind of thing, but this is about making the core of functional programming incredibly expressive and powerful in real and practical programming. And so all the features we're adding to F sharp five and in six uh, high performance computation expressions, tasks, anonymous unions, some uh, additional tweaks to type inference. All of this is about continuing and making that uh, core functional programming ex experience even more kind of powerful and effective. Okay, so in closing, uh, the F sharp emphasis all the way through clear code to solve real world problems. It's always stay, it's always been what it's about, uh, uh, and it's it's where we're at today, and that is. That tells you the kind of code that I love. Not all functional code is good code. Think long and hard about how to make uh, your functional code as clear and as welcoming and as simple as possible. And, and this key point I brought out, uh, own the word object programming, learn to love some, uh, some elements of, of object programming, and then reject the object-oriented programming aspects uh, that, that take you down that rabbit hole. Okay, and I will head over to the chat and we can take questions. And just to say, if you want the um, 
you want to learn F sharp or you want to point your colleagues, perhaps even more importantly, uh, to learn F sharp from the ground up, uh, the Udemy course is a fa fabulous one that I do recommend. Uh, and it's, uh, it's only a couple of few bucks and it's really easy, really good course. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, let's take the questions now.